screen one. Let's try that. Share screen one. So now you can see yeah, my browser, good. correct? Yeah. And now you can see ACDC. Look at correct? that, guys. Look at this. Oh, this look at that. Beautiful uh, uh, Q&A session there. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks great, Alex. <laughs> OK, excellent. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll leave, we'll leave it. A, we'll leave one more minute more. We'll fill for one more minute. Yeah, sounds good. Oh, I, I lost my screen of, of everybody in the chat. Um, I might just have to rely on you on that one. That's okay. You can also, I think if you go to the, if you scroll up to the very top, Alec, or wherever you have that, like you, uh, the little green bar, the banner that, uh, yes. when you, yeah, if yeah. you pull that, if you hug next to that, it, it'll give you like attendees as a, or participants rather, and you can just pull it to another monitor. Okay. Thank you. It came back. Look at Hopefully. that. Yeah. And Q and a over there as well. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so yeah, we'll start in a little bit once we've had a couple more people filter in. But yeah, just a, again, everyone, um, this this is a course that Alec has actually sort of uh, made available through ACDC. And it's using ACDC for parts of the course. Uh, but yeah, uh, I've just added to the chat, if you're interested in purchasing it, um, we're going to be sort of covering uh, some aspects of it today, but not the full thing. Uh, yeah, just feel free to click on that link and it'll give you a little promo code so you can get a $5 off when you go to purchase it in the checkout. So, awesome. Yeah. awesome. Almost free for you today. It's, it's the Mexico in me. I couldn't help myself. I noticed that we have uh, Graham from Christchurch, New Zealand. Welcome, oh, really? Graham. Uh, I was an exchange student. Uh, back in, well i wouldn't, wouldn't even say how long ago i was an exchange student and i went to gore high school and then ended up living in queenstown that was that used to be my home oh that's cool as that a beautiful part of the world new zealand so welcome welcome from christchurch okay shall we get started on this yeah let's go for it um let's i'm gonna this. i'm just gonna like i'm gonna go swap between um like I'm, I'm gonna unmute my mic until someone has a question, and I'll, and I'll enter in. And if I have a question, I'll ask you as well. But I'm just gonna keep it like so okay. that you don't hear any of my awkward breathing. <laughs> so okay, that that sounds awkward just yeah. right there. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> okay, welcome everybody. So this summer, man, this summer was a weird one for me, probably for you guys too, uh, for all of us. One of the things, you know, that we noticed obviously on social media with our kind of COVID summer was, you know, how political everything gets with people and upset. But you know what? There was also some really good things that came out of it. One of them for me was working more at, at home and having like family time and time for kind of reassessing where I wanted to put my energies because uh, generally work-wise, I travel uh, for work. So I live, on, like home for me is on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. And work for me is usually in LA and sometimes New York or Toronto or, or London. And then, you know, then it's just some travel stuff. But generally I fly down to LA for work and come home. And I have not flown since March. So that's kind of uh, a, a big change for me. During this big change, it was just like, well, what am I going to do? I was like, well, you know what? I used to take pictures for fun. <laughs> and somewhere along the line, I forgot about that. And I was just like, you know what? I should take pictures for fun again. And as I did that, I realized this is why I take photos. And it was almost, I, I don't know how many of you guys are, you know, what we've got. I actually be interested if you want to throw it in the comments of we've got like uh, professionals, amateurs, hobbyists, the things you like taking photos of. For me, it's people. Love photographing people. And that, you know, that was how the passion started for me. And so I thought to myself, you know what? I'm having so much fun doing this. I should share this for the ACDC users because I, I get a lot of emails on that kind of stuff. I made that, that course like whams. I have just kind of my workflow, which is, you know, it's the workflow I personally use all the time, but in terms of like an outcome, where you're going to take better pictures immediately, probably not that interesting. So I made portraits 101 for you guys. And it's my workflow for portraits. If I went back to the beginning and knowing what I know now, <laughs> but didn't know then, so what I did, Sam has mentioned I, that he's in here for sports photography or does sports photography, which is pretty cool. Okay. 
amateur uh, bird in nature photography. What? Yeah. And then, you... uh, yeah, just an amateur photographer from Paul. So someone who's like probably intermediate there. Yeah, that's kind of cool. That's something we haven't really awesome. talked about too much is like nature photography. Actually, yeah. Photography too. I, Those are things that would be interesting to, yeah. I, I would actually like to um, bring in some specialists on on that kind of stuff at some time and maybe do like some some live stuff with those guys or, or travel around and so we can do some shooting with them and post-processing it's kind of one of the ideas i've had for a long time because there's so many different specialties right and mm -hmm. it's amazing how we use the same tool in such different ways uh david said concert photography uh which is kind of cool we've we had one of our previous uh like um uh uh, the one that we did, like sort of a, our main video series on our YouTube, but she was a concert photographer. So that's cool. Really? I, I actually used to travel around doing concert photography myself in the, in the early days and uh, still, you know, well, not that there's many concerts anymore, but we yeah. still love to do that. <laughs> um, so I guess my, like as a, as a commercial photographer, I shoot ad campaigns which is really about shooting people, but it's very targeted for a specific audience. So I'm working with the brand and we're working under very strict limitations of, you know, how we're trying to reach an audience. It's a very different job when you go to do a portrait of someone and super enjoyable. So my goal was to pass along what I do during that. So I went to my, my own little hometown, which I've honestly never shot in before. And so I was just like, okay, if I was a photographer, how would I scout locations for our European friends? You're going to have way better places to photograph than what I had to photograph in my tiny little uh, West Coast town. So I had some, some difficult uh, shooting conditions. I, and then I purposely chose bad lighting as a campaign photographer, one of the reasons that I shoot with lights so much is because of the consistency of lights. And so if we're, if we're shooting a campaign, we need eight hours of the light looking kind of the same or, or very controlled. When you go to shoot for somebody else or for enjoyment or take photographs of people, generally they're not showing up in great light and you probably don't have all the lights that I have. So what do you do? So that was kind of one of the goals was just like, okay, if I'm going to be a natural light photographer and someone says, Alec, can you do a great photo of me at one o'clock in the afternoon in August? Uh, <laughs> you know, the light is right above. What would I do? So I went through my little hometown and I found places where you would not expect uh, light to be and went through and explained why the light would be great in the, like what would look like this kind of rundown entrance to a building. And Just out of curiosity, Alec, what yeah. time of day did you shoot um, when you were out? Like, cause oftentimes like we, we've talked about in the past in other workshops too, like there's specific times of day that are obviously the golden hour for shooting. Yes. So when were you out? Were you at like midday sort of thing? So yeah, I, I, what I did, I wanted to shoot at different times of day to show w what the, what my approach would be. Mm -hmm. And so for, for this, for so this uh, guy was a, lo a local model named Eddie. And uh, I picked uh, on purpose an awful time of day. <laughs> so <laughs> for something that you might be faced with. So I looked for uh, what we call open shade and put together an, an approach and, and, I mean, I can't run you through this, but basically a, a, a quick notes version. When you put somebody under an awning in open shade or in an entryway to a door, what you're doing is you're taking away a whole bunch of light mm. that would be hitting them. And so you can see there's a ton of light hitting me over here. Yeah. What I'm really doing is by placing him under here, I am using this area outside here, everything that's bouncing off buildings and light as a softbox, because that's what he's actually lit by. And so, in fact, you have this really giant softbox outside if you know where to find it. And the way you find it is by blocking light. And so this is one of the approaches I used here. And hmm. this becomes great. And I, t I turned this set of shots into a whole bunch of uh, black and whites uh, in terms of like 
what would be call what I would consider a pretty good black and white headshot shot with no expensive lighting in, at a really crappy time of day and turn it into a whole series of good headshots. And I thought that would be super useful for people. Um, when I said all our British friends, uh, no, sorry, your European friends are going to have way better places. Sorry, I'm, I, I grew up in England, and uh, <laughs> this is the best we have for columns in the whole town. That's it. <laughs> oh no! Everything else looks yeah. like a little storefront. <laughs> yeah. Um, everywhere I go in Europe looks awesome. You guys have a huge advantage to shooting daylight, so I shot what I would call high key uh, and backlit, and what the approach would be to that. Yeah. And. Then a, our one single closed up alley that we have in our whole little town of which you guys uh, in most places have zillions and why I would shoot in there. And I, again, this comes down to when we were talking about time of day, this little sliver of light, like the, the alley feels like it's probably eight feet wide with buildings that are 30 feet high. So it's a little sliver of light coming down just above. So there is a time of day when the light's going to land in the alley, but most of the time, the light's just gonna be bouncing around in here. And so that becomes a really advantageous place to shoot. And color temperature goes all over the place because now your, your lighting is actually by red bricks, like a red brick wall and a kind of a, a natural stone brick wall. Mm. And so we talk about going through that and correcting out that. And that's what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna take you through uh, one of the additions to um, uh, ADC Ultimate 2021. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a huge mouthful, is a color grading uh, suite, uh, uh, color wheels. I love color wheels, was so happy to see that. So that's yeah. what we're gonna do today. I'm gonna take you through that. And then when you were asking about time of day, I also did golden hour. And un, uh, which, you know, you can clearly see from the video camera is just like, you know, that is like shooting fish in a barrel. <laughs> there is, that is just awesome light. Unfortunately, for the day that I filmed, I gave the models a wrong time by about half an hour. And then they showed up half an hour late. <laughs> so by the they time lost they an showed, hour, yeah. I lost an hour of the shoot. And I literally in this shoot had 40 seconds of this light. And... Uh, and I was going to cancel the shoot. And I was just like, you know what? This had happened to you guys too. And this turned into my light about 40 seconds later. Wow, and it's so it, dramatically different. That's unreal. Yeah, and 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 it, you can actually see it in the video. Like it yeah. literally is like, you look up, there's a sliver of sun. I said, I'm not even going to talk. I'm going to shoot. I'll tell you what I did afterwards, which is how we handled it. And then we did photos in like this really dark overcast light. Mm -hmm. And because you're, you know, you're, you're faced with these conditions when you don't get to reset. I mean, that's a classic example too. It's like your talent is going to be late, like quite literally, <laughs> you know, yes. before we start, Alec, I had two yeah. questions that I thought were interesting. Yes. Maybe Good. one. So Ed asked, um, they used to do a lot of people photography, um, and he had issues with skin blemishes that were on arms, legs, etc. And he just asked mm. how to handle. Is that something we can maybe cover near the end of the? Um, yeah, it absolutely. Yeah. You know what? I'm gonna. What I was gonna do. I'll, I'll tell you guys right now. I am going to do two uh, little tutorials here. One, I want to go through color wheels on this image here. And then the second image I want to do was when we kind of had that, believe it or not, this one is actually in overcast, the, uh, this image here. It's just color temperature that's making that look warm and happy. And we can go through some, there's some blemishes in here. So we will, we will correct those. Okay, cool. And then the other question I think was a comment from Ted here. And he says that he does genealogy. And that uh, often he has to do a lot of group photo photos and naturally has to crop and enhance people to make a po uh, portrait photo from essentially what was a group photo. Oh, wow. um, and he asked okay. just uh, what are some of the challenges to doing this? I, I mean, we've done a bit of genealogy work on in terms of like restoring old photographs, but I've never like sort of worked with group photo photographs in that sort yeah. of sense. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know what? Let's, um, on that one, I think that one is actually a, a really cool question to do a future workshop on. Yeah, I agree. Um, because there's a bunch of techniques that would work into a whole bunch of other stuff. And 
I'd honestly have to be prepped for that one. Oh yeah, totally. That's why I figured not, <laughs> more of a write, comment write for that now. down because oh, yeah. I, I think that's yeah. great. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Anyway, carry on. I, those are the two that. Okay, awesome. Thanks yeah. for passing that along. Okay, so this particular photo is a lot different to all these, and not just because it's in color, but because Eddie here is not looking into camera. And most of the images that I shoot, most of the images that probably most of us shoot have people looking into camera. And when we don't look into camera, uh, that makes it more filmic for me. When we're, when we're filming, unless, you know, it's a, a very, you know, an odd movie, generally nobody is breaking the fourth wall and looking into camera. And so this makes it ideal for kind of a, a filmic kind of look. I, I sometimes shoot uh, promos for movies and any day that I'm, I'm on set, I always go and shoot some BTS and like behind the scenes. So for the, the director, cinematographer and actors, make sure they get some, you know, really cool shots on set and then they'll use those in social media. And then I'll, I'll shoot the promos during that day too. But one of the things that you'll notice, let me pull this up. Uh, here we go. Uh, anybody know the the bodyguard? I, I watched it on Netflix a few weeks ago. I love the color on British shows, and I bring this up for a reason. This is just a, a still frame. Um, is that color grading, Alex? That's Alex, color grading. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, is that similar to like using like a LUT in that sense? Uh, or, you know what? I'm going to say yes, but a LUT is actually generally built out of color wheels. Oh, I and see. Okay. Let, you know what? I'm going to write myself a note for that. Hang on. Color grade. I'm going to, we'll come back to the word LUT. Cool. Okay. Now, what I found, because I, I picked this one specifically because I loved the color grading on this show. And a lot of British shows, they have, <laughs> sounds, it sounds mean, uh, they have very dreary colors. It's one of the ways you can sometimes pick a British show is... Uh, the the coldness the, the blueness of everything and the unsaturated skin tones now what's interesting is when you look at the still photographers versions of the shots of the movies so like like i said when i'm when i'm photographing sorry i hit the wrong button let's go back here this is how it came out of camera right and when the set photographer is shooting on set they're going to shoot it and they're probably going to use the color in their camera because uh, they might not be allowed to color grade it in a certain way because you don't know how it's going to be used. And when you're on set, you have no idea what the final color grade of the movie is going to be. So you can't make them match. It's something that I get to do when I'm working on a commercial campaign because say I, I'm in charge of the final look of the project. So when I'm doing the photos for it, I can match the two. And you'll find that the promos for a movie generally never match the color grading of the movie. And so we're gonna show you how to get a filmic look out of your photos to make it look like a movie. One of the reasons that we do this in film is because the color tells a story, right? So you'll notice if, if you go through, and this is just a good example, I, I, won't, I won't go through it, but if you, if you Google uh, the bodyguard um, images, you'll see bright colored images and you'll see dreary colored images. And that is the color grader on the movie helping tell the story. The color becomes a character in the movie. So with that being uh, dreary and blue, um, you know, there's something sad going on there. There's tension going on there. It's not happy. We tend to think of colorful and happy. So this image, it, it's overall very warm. Let's go into the develop suite. It's overall Alec, very warm. Yeah. Um, Maurice asked, uh, do you step through or do you do a rather a step through of the whole process from start to finish for each photo in your course? Absolutely. I yeah. Okay, cool. So, so uh, the approach course wise is, and this was actually, I wrote myself a note on this. Thanks for bringing that up. What I found, because I, I mean, I, I, we all learn the same way, right? We, we learn from books, we learn from YouTube. When I, when I started, I didn't have YouTube, but I went and did workshops. One of the things that we tend to make assumptions on is that 
the pros have these awesome retouching people that make the shots amazing. <laughs> and what I wanted to do with this was <laughs> uh, pull Oz's curtain back, if you like. Yeah. And I, I chose non-professional models on purpose because I wanted, I wanted results that felt achievable for, for everybody. And th there, there are, you know, even on the little island that I live on, there are like full-time professional models that, you know, they travel and they come back and live here. And I was going to start with that. And I think much to the chagrin of the marketing department <laughs> who thought that was a great idea. <laughs> I was just like, you know, <laughs> it, it seems like it would be more attainable if I went with attractive, m more normal looking people, mm -hmm. went with tough conditions and gave you the entire workflow. So what I wanted to do was as I go into the shoot, I chose my area for light and why. Uh, I go through my camera settings and why. So the, the Wamsai course comes up in here a bit. Uh, I, I talk about why I chose the things that I chose. Uh, I run through the photos. Then I go through the process of everything I do in uh, Ultimate 2020 or 2021. Because one of the things that happens, see, if we watch a, a YouTube thing on photography, we then have to translate it into uh, into ACDC. And of course, you know, my, my background it obviously came from, uh, you know, Photoshop from way back when it started like 20 versions ago. And a lot of the techniques that I, I, I created along the way came from that. And so I have to do my own conversion. But for you guys, it's just like, why should you have to learn uh, the conversion yeah, when totally. it's possible to get this right from beginning to end. So that was my goal was just like, okay, Here's my photos. I want to ingest them. I want to give them keywords. And then I want to tell you why I choose the shots that I choose. And then I go into the processing all in ACDC. So that was my goal was to give you something that is like turnkey beginning to end. I also added in the, my own raw files. So this shot specifically, any shots that I am doing retouching on, there's a download section. In fact, I can probably click on it. Let's go there. Let's go to this shot here over on the, how can we see it? It's somewhere on here. There we go. Downloads. There yeah, is the totally. raw shot. Cool. That's and super cool. So, yeah. So you can have the actual raw shot, not JPEG. <laughs> Again, much to my chagrin <laughs> because I noticed uh, yesterday I was just like, oh, are you kidding me? ISO 800, 800th of a second. That's a little overkill. <laughs> Apparently, one of those things of, like I mentioned, uh, talking and doing things at the same time, you know, in, in a perfect world, I probably would. Uh, 2.8 is a safe place on my really fast 1.4 lens. And you, uh, for people who are like really into aperture and, and shooting shallow, they're probably looking at that going, wow, 2.8, like you could have gone way shallower. But clearly in this alley, I did not need to be shallower than that. And it, at 2.8, it's that safety zone where if my camera misses, I get my shot. And that, that comes from my commercial world. Whereas if I was you know, shooting for myself, I'd probably shallow that up. What I would do, however, 800th of a second, yeah, I probably would not be shooting a portrait up there. I, I 200th maybe and get, get down to ISO 200 or 400, get myself a, a, little, a little more noise free. Though that said, the camera's native ISO probably is actually ISO 800. So there, there probably isn't an advantage to going under that. So I, I'm just letting you know that I think I did that wrong. <laughs> and, uh, that's one of the bonuses is I hid nothing from you guys. It is all in here, uh, flaws and all. Alec being completely transparent. <laughs> that's <Yes>. awesome. <laughs> okay, so color wheels. This is what I wanted to talk about. This is one of the exciting additions. So I'll go ahead and click on, oh, not color wheels, tone wheels, tone wheels, eh, as in all three of them. Now, before we do that, I'm going to tell you one of the secrets to good color grading is I could go into tone wheels right now and I could dial stuff in. But, and, and this just comes from film world. 
I can't even tell you if it's right or not, but I went to film school and this is the way color graders do it. And so this is my approach. And I know that those guys, they're the pros at what they do. And if they tell me this is the way to do it, that's the way I do it. So I'm passing it along to you the way I learned it. Before we go to color grading and give something a look, we equalize the camera and uh, equalize the image and optimize it the best we can to say fit a, fit a histogram or uh, I, I can pull up the histogram, but what I wanted to show you, I, I don't want to rely on histograms. I want to rely on our eyes. And I can tell you that this bit of his collar here, we are losing detail there because it's a little bit hot, right? Now, there's two problems with that with color grading. One is that there's going to be no detail there. The bigger problem, however, is when you're color grading, meaning you're adding color something to something, you can't add color to white. Uh, Adam, do you know why? Uh, yeah, because it has the highest saturation of R, G, and B. So if you add color to it, you're not, you can't add color to white. It's exactly, yeah. that, you know what, that, that was a better answer than I was going to come up with. <laughs> Thank you for that. That is exactly why you can't add color to white. If on a scale of zero to 100, that is already somewhere at around 100. If you go to add color, it has to add numbers. It's just math, right? And it can't go higher than 100. So we are going to take the highlights and pull them back. And just like magic, we notice, oh, look at that. There's texture in there. And it's not like this was going to be a bad picture or anything. And if I didn't change much, it was probably fine. But if I'm going to color grade, I can't have burnt out white because you will see where the color grade goes wrong. And that's probably one of the reasons that we go in here. So now the next... There, so Alec, are you functionally just like pulling the highlights into closer to midtones in that in that yeah. uh, context? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Now, I there's two ways to do that. There's a zillion ways. Like I could pull the overall exposure down to do that, but when we used to work with film, who who's old enough to to have worked with film here? We can, we can, we can pull that up in in the answers. Yeah, just yeah. For interest. <laughs> Sound off in uh, chatter or Q and A. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I started kind of as a kid in film. Yeah, they're coming, they're coming in. Yeah, yeah, Dwayne, exactly. Jason, Paul, Randy, uh, Ma, Alexander. So we have people that have worked in film. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And so one of the things that's great about film is it's a lot harder to burn in than uh, what it is in digital. And this used to be a really big problem. It's not such a big problem anymore because when we shoot in RAW, we have a big dynamic range. I, our dynamic range is about the same as film, but we don't tend to roll off the highlights like we do in film. So I think, I believe it's totally acceptable to pull the highlights back just like this when you need to do that. And that works a little like film. What you'll find though, unlike film, is when I do that, I've lost contrast in here. I, 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 can you see that on your end, Adam? That it, it kind of... Yeah, there's a lot of loss of contrast for sure. It's a, Yeah, it, yeah, you're yeah, noticing that. Okay. All the saturations are sort of pulled into the midtones. Uh, let me, you know what, I am going to pull up a histogram because I'm going to explain something next. Okay, now I'm going to go to contrast next. If you were to draw a line down, I, okay, I'm assuming, I sh and I shouldn't, that everybody knows what a histogram kind of is. Uh, let, I'll, I'll just say quickly, over here is our blacks, over here is our whites. Now we can see that there's nothing burnt out white anymore. And that would have been probably that color. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's way burnt out. There we go. We can see when I get up here, nothing is burnt out. And I like to use my eye for this uh, rather than the histogram because my eye will actually kind of get it right over the histogram and experience for you guys will do the same. Now, if I were to put a line down the middle of this, that's a really bad mouse line I just created. <laughs> well, we'll find is that most of the information in this image is in the lower side of the contrast and not in the upper end, if we're in agreement on that. What that means is when we put on contrast, what happens when you turn up contrast is everything to the left of this line, this side goes further left, everything to the right of this line goes further right. So if I turn up the contrast in, in your head, uh, which is the image going to get darker or lighter? And because everything is kind of on the left side of the line, it's going to head towards darker. So as I turn this contrast up, odds all being right, 
my image is going to get darker. There we go. And more saturated. And we're not peaking any of the colors, right? Yeah. Wh so why is that, Alec? What's that? Why, why, are, why is the contrast not increasing any of the, the like, it's not doing anything to the histogram? Um, actually, you know, I think the histogram is just not updating for some reason live. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, I, it was yesterday. <laughs> I, uh, might have a, I might have a little mini crash going on here, <laughs> but yes, generally that moves. <laughs> if you were to just close it and reopen it, would it adjust? Let, I'm just curious. Yeah, let, yeah exactly. Let's yeah. see. Yeah, I don't. And maybe it'll just be happy after that. Uh, where it's one you? more up. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, so it has adjusted slightly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I got a little more saturated than I want to. Now here's, here's something that we may or may not notice in here. When it comes to white balance, and actually I just wanna show you something quickly because that reminded me of something. Let, my, uh, my screen here, you can, can you see my desktop? Yep. It is gray back here. Mm -hmm. I keep my desktop gray, like a, a gray card, a neutral gray card. And there's a reason that I do that. I, and I keep it clean because one, I don't need stuff on my desktop because I can always find it if I need it. But I like to have a gray card back here because I, and I don't know if this works on your end as well, but when I'm in here, I've turned up the contrast. I know that it's, I notice it's a little saturated and I notice that it's a little warm. Um, ACDC is gray, neutral gray, which is awesome. For me, uh, I like working on a darker background like this, but I, my eye doesn't see color temperature quite as well against this gray as it does a gray card. And so anytime I want to check out um, my white balance, I will just have a look. Let's move. I feel like that would be a good idea to add as just like a thing you could pop up as a modal menu, literally just called a gray card that you could like pull over your image to just verify like your gray versus like the saturation in this case. Yeah. Now I don't know if you noticed that, but for me, suddenly this image now looks orange. Yeah. Like 100%. it looks way more saturated than yeah. it did a minute ago. Yeah. Because of the black. Ver yeah, totally. And so I don't notice that when I'm against the dark, my, my eyes like working against the dark because I, I work in front of the computer a lot and the lighter, this color the whole time would give me eye fatigue and I want to concentrate on my image. But anytime I want to work on color, it's just like, I want to pull that up. And actually my, my edit suite that I'm in is this color. Like every, I am surrounded by this color. Not that you want to do that to your house, but this is this is a good fix. Okay, so let me put that back up to, which I won't maximize it because we might do that again. There we go. So white balance is clearly off. Now, if we go in here, we'll notice that there's this crazy number, 15K. Uh, probably you're not ever likely to see that number. The reason it's so crazy off is because I am in a basically a red room. There's a sliver of blue light up above me, but the walls on either side are bright red. So if I bring this down, suddenly it gets really dark, but you'll notice that this now looks white. And you didn't notice before that it didn't look white, or at least if you're like me, I didn't really notice. And now it looks really dark. And so I bring it up and it's just like, oh, look, that looks more like skin tone. That is clearly white. And for me, this is kind of, this is kind of magic. So because you change something in the white balance. And this is like you said, we're not color grading this image yet. We're still working with, uh, you know, whatever you'd taken it. And, and right now we're going through the process of adjusting the contrast and cooling the image slightly so we can start to actually work with those uh, tone wheels. Yeah, we, we want to get it. We want to get it neutralized. Um, so my and thank you for saying cooling. I was just like, I just looked at it again. I was like, yeah, actually it is cool. So probably that feels better. I take a quick peek at my gray and that feels more like a brick color. That yeah. feels like skin tone. That feels like white. Right. And so, you know, sometimes you can, you can dial this in uh, automatically or have a gray card. Sometimes you just got to go by feel because this one's just going to be wrong because he is functionally lit by by lights that are a completely different color than you know are what are useful to us 
So then lastly, maybe just a little bit of fill light underneath. And there we go. There is, that feels like a well-exposed photo. And if I look at my histogram, which I'm going to kill in a minute, we've got full range. If I were to draw a line down the middle, you know, skin tones, you want kind of landing in there. Every, everything looks right to my eye in the picture. And the histogram kind of agrees that that looks like kind of a neutralized photo. Alec, may I? I'm just yes. curious because like when you, you essentially shifted a lot of those colors into the midtones into like a moderate saturation, was that intended or was that just the byproduct of, in this case, you utilizing your own eye to, to you know, adjust this image? That, good question. That, that was, that was my eye. What you'll notice, remember, remember when, before I, I touched that color temperature, how oversaturated this image was? It was it was really deep orange. Are you are you with me on that? Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm following. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you check the saturation and vibrance now, mm -hmm. they're both they're both at zero. Yep. So the picture wasn't actually overly saturated. I just didn't have the exposure and color temperature set. And once the color temperature got set, then the exposure needed to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. And everything, it was amazing how that just all kind of neutralized by itself. And yeah, I, I just eyeballed that in. But I would, I would have tended, had I not gone to the gray screen, to start pulling my saturation down. So my sense. question then would yeah. be, for those of, that are maybe like new or like uh, amateur photographers, uh, are they, should they rely on the histogram in, in addition to help them sort of familiarize uh, themselves with, uh, you know, a, like a cult, uh, like the palette of an image in this case, or would you say that, oh no, it just more rely on your eye and, and use the histogram in, in specific instances? I would, I, that's a, that's a great question. I would say the histogram is a good tool. It can for sure tell you when you got too much black and when you're burnt out, your eye can also do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Right, your eye will absolutely tell you when you have no detail in something. I can I can tell you right now that when I go to color grade this, that that spot here is still too bright for color grading. And if I were filming, the color grading team would be very unhappy with me for filming too hot. Yeah, totally. And we'll, when we color grade, that's going to show up. I, the, the histogram is a good tool. When I when I used to work, so my first career was I. I was a hobby photographer and a recording engineer. And we used to have, uh, when I started out, there was a thing called an RTA, a real-time analyzer. And it looked really cool. It was basically a, a histogram for audio with bouncing lights. And it would show you where the energy was in your mix. And so I would literally look at things that looked like a histogram and try to match my personal mix to the histogram. Yeah. And of course, it sounded nothing like it. <laughs> But I was under the misconception that instead of using my ears to learn how to do this, I wanted to make it look like that. And here's the flaw with histograms is if you try to make your image look right in the histogram, the histogram is specifically just information that's in that image. There's not a right histogram or a wrong histogram. Right. So there's a diminishing returns in, in essentially how one can utilize the histogram. Yeah, and, that, and that's why I didn't want to like pull it up and keep on showing that. It, 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 it's, a, it's a good feature just to, to show people how it works in terms of brightness and darkness. And if the other, the other place that a histogram is really useful is if your monitor is not aligned properly. Like if your, your black or your whites are way out. And monitors and color systems are way better on computers than they used to be. Um, you don't need to color align as much. Uh, especially with HDMI cords and new monitors. But th the histogram is just a great tool. But you know what? Your eyes are a way better tool. And things like having a, a gray background to check in on and then go back and look at your picture is going to beat your histogram. Cool. That, that really answers my question. Thanks. Okay. Tone wheels. Let's have some fun. So we got this dialed in. Let's go quickly and have a peek back at the bodyguard. Okay, so what we notice here, not that I'm going to try and match these, but literally when they filmed this, 
Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what cameras they they were on. They they were. It's it's going to be an Ari Alexa or a, like a Sony Venice. I don't think this was a red. Um, either way, the actual filming would have looked like these colors, honestly, which is really weird. And so when you were talking about LUTs, we're going to come back to that idea of a LUT. When when you're filming like a really intense scene and you're on set and it looks like this, this is really uninspiring. It does not look like you're making a movie, right? So let's make it look like we're making a movie. So Alec, before we do yeah. that, can we, uh, there's yeah. two questions. Um, sure. Tal asked, uh, he was curious why you didn't touch like a uh, tint in the white balance. Was there a reasoning for that? Um, yes. Uh, so tint for everybody. So uh, I wonder if I, I'm just going to explain this orally. So it's quick. You have two axes in your, in your color. Uh, white balance is blue to yellow, mm -hmm. and tint is green to magenta. If I noticed, gr the places I'm going to notice green or magenta are in my neutrals. I do not have a lot of neutrals in this, but I do have his shirt, and I do have this collar. And especially this area of the collar, this is in the neutrals. And if this had a green tint or a magenta tint, then I would have gone to tint. But as that feels pretty neutral, I didn't touch those. Right. So there isn't really any pre-existing uh, magentas or greens in this image to really adjust, That's right. adjust in that way. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to note it. You're going to find you're going to want to use tint when you shoot around trees or grass because now you have a green reflector. Totally. Yeah. And that's when that's going to show up. I'm in a red room. I've got no green or magenta uh, in my picture really to, to throw things off. So that's probably why I didn't have to adjust that. Okay, so looking at our color wheels. This is to do with our highlights. This wheel is to do with our midtones. This is our shadows. So our shadows are, we can think of as down here, this guy here, under here. Our midtones, man, we got a lot of midtones in this photo. Most of this falls into midtones. If we think about our histogram again, actually, I'll pull it up, not because you need to use a histogram to do this, so don't. But just so we're explaining stuff as as a visual method, this guy is working on things kind of in this area here. There's not a lot in this photo. This midtones is working on a huge area through here, which will be most of the picture. The highlights is just this area up here, and that's probably this area of this collar and the rim around his hair. So what we tend to do is we like to cool off the shadows. So we can immediately just take the shadows and move them over. Now, this comes from audio for me. When I used to work on effects in, in mixing, I used to crank the effect. So there's my effect all the way on, 100% on. And what I do is then I look for something that's pleasing. And you're gonna notice colors that, that work for the image, like that does not work for the image. There's something in there that works for the image. That works for the image. And you know what? I actually don't, you, a real color grader can probably tell you the answer on that. Somewhere in here kind of works for this image for me too. And probably what it has to do with is R, G, and B in, in our picture. And there's areas that, where it eats up all the contrast and where the contrast comes back. So there's a teal area. Uh, we call it we call it teal. It's just off the blues and before you get to the greens, somewhere in there where yeah. this image, like you wouldn't think you could add like 100% blue teal into the shadows and still have an interesting photo. Yet there it is. It's a little heavy handed. So we this is where we get to dial it back to taste. So there's my shadows. And what we'll notice is that his skin is still relatively untouched. This side of his face certainly, you know, is a little overdone. But now we're going to do the same here. We're going to crank on the mids. And we can see that is most of our photo. There's our, our shadows that are still in that blue. But here we're gonna we're gonna maybe warm this image slightly. And there's a spot in there that just looks great on skin tones, where now his skin tone is all one color. And we use this a lot. So this gets rid of, especially guys who don't wear makeup, uh, 
if, if you're, you know, Scottish background like me, I have, uh, when we were talking about magentas early, earlier, I have magentas in my skin, reds in my skin that show up on digital sensors that don't show up on film. And this is one of the great things about film was when they formulated it, they put this in on purpose. And so when you go through film formulations, they made skin tones kind of do this. And so we're just emulating what film would do. And there we go. I think it's interesting too that you gravitated to like a yellowy orange spectrum because like skin tone, no matter what, like, you know, uh, no, no matter what uh, sort of like ethnicity someone is, it always falls under the orange spectrum. Like if you were to use the color picker to like click on somebody's skin, who's like, you know, from Norway and then to click on their skin and somebody who's from like Uganda, it's like always falls under the like orange spectrum of light. So I don't yes. know. I just, it's interesting that you gravitate to that choice, you know? Well, you know what, for me, there's two choices. So, so that's one. I'll take it around the other side too. There's one I like over, over here as well. And it's super cold and blue, but you can just add on a touch of that. And you know, there's an interesting indie film look right there. Totally. And, yeah. And I, I love that one uh, for when I want people to look good instead of, you know, as well as tell the story. It's that one kind of over there. And then I can just dial this into taste. And what, one of the things that's interesting to me is now as I roll this guy in and out, I can go for a more natural muted tone look. This kind of, I, I'm still maybe slightly oversaturated for that British look, but it's amazing that I actually added color to this image, yet it looks less colorful. Does that make sense? I'm yeah, I mean, like, I feel like you've totally color corrected it. Like before it was slightly warm in essence. And yeah. now you have something that like, you're really applying the, the, the tone wheels in a way that's sort of like giving the skin, you know, like, wow, just even that dramatic, like that was so dramatic, that slight change in saturation. Yeah, and it was just, it was just, a, it was just a little oversaturated. And there we are for me, that now has like a really awesome look to it. It looks filmic. And it looks like, uh, you know, it looks like a, a, a great magazine shot. And, you know, it, it was really just kind of an average shot of a guy in an alley with, with good lighting. But it's amazing how a little bit of color grading raises the bar. For Alec, me, can at you, least way up. Can you yeah. click on the show original just so like people can get a, an idea of like, is that really the original image? That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's color grading. I am super excited about color wheels. So huge, oh, keep on, keep, they're called color wheels. They're undertone wheels, uh, the, the multiple ones. So a, a color, co color wheel works the same. Tone wheels is, is the name for it. I, from color grading, I call them color wheels. So I get confused on that all the time. There we go. So that is, I took way too long on that one. <laughs> no, we had a lot of good but, questions and like that, that's yeah. gonna, that's gonna happen for sure. So. Yeah. Um, everybody still hanging in here. Cause I will run on to another one. Yeah. We, we still really? have the same amount okay. of attendees and everybody's hanging out. There we go. Okay. Let's move on to, I'm going to, heck, I'll just discard that cause we can do it again. That's what's fun about that. Okay, let's go into the edit suite on this one. So this image, this was shot, this, is, this one's crazy to me. Uh, this, is, this was shot when I was gonna quit. <laughs> I was gonna go, <laughs> this day sucks. Um, I'm gonna get people to come out again. So this magic light uh, here, this is not that. This one was shot uh, literally minutes later, actually, let's see, Bianca shoot. There we go. That was shot under this condition here. And you can see the condition that I am shooting under is pretty awful. It's like, for me, that's just like quit and go home. And if you, oh, where'd my mouse go? Come back onto the screen. There we go. If you dial it in right, uh, it just amazes me that you can pull that out of a digital camera. So anyway, uh, a lesson on that. And you know what? That was a lesson to me too, because I, I, I had a specific mindset going into that shoot that I was going to do a shoot under magic light and show you all the magic that can happen. And the difference being that 
under the real magic light, all this grass uh, lights up as little bubbles where you can see these bubbles here, back here, like everything would light up. And it would be a magic shot. And you know what? It was honestly, it was my ego getting in the way of wanting to show you how awesome I can make something look. <laughs> and instead, it actually just turned into a really great lesson for myself and hopefully for you guys too. So the, the full lessons on that as well as the raw download. So we're just going to have a look at some things that we would do in the edit suite to this shot to take it up to finished. And I'll be quick-ish on this one. Hey, Alec, I got a question yeah. that uh, yes. from Roger here that I think would make for probably something we can't cover today, but something I think it would be good for another like workshop or tutorial yeah. or something like that. But how to um, address like uh, the the skin tone or how to address sort of like the uh, the contrast and, and similar to what we just did um, on a couples where they, you know, have different ethnicities. So like someone's oh, black and someone's that's white. That's a good one. Yeah. Yes. Um, you know what? I am going to, I got, uh, Roger, I have got a note down here. I tell you what I'm going to do. I have in this, it's not completely diff different ethnicities. Uh, Manuela, uh, she is Colombian, uh, quite dark skinned Eddie that we were photographing earlier. Um, he, he looks, I, I'm not his, I'm not sure his background. He looks pretty much Scottish like me. <laughs> um, so very, very different color treatments. You cannot treat them the same in right. the same shot. I am going to go ahead and I am going, I, cause I took pictures of those two together. I will make a lesson that I will add to the course. That's cool. And it will be uh, specifically on those two for that very reason. So Adding that in, that is a great addition. Um, I'd actually take, they're, they're a couple and they came out and so I just took some pictures of them. And it's just like, you know what? That's a great reason to use those pictures. Okay, so uh, bonus material, add it in. So for this one, what I wanted to do, hey, oh, Adam, question. Sk uh, yeah, shoot. Skin tune, was this added over here? No, that's been in that product for a while. It's, it's like, been over here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just used it over here. <laughs> they're okay. wait, but they are slightly different, uh, though. Yes. I think the skin I, tune that's the adjustment layers, you might need to utilize more masking, and then the one that's the yes. filter will have like more functionalities. Okay, uh, but, I like yeah. this one over here. Yeah, yeah, go for the yeah. <laughs> I, that's what I was going to show you, and I was just like, has that always been there? <laughs> okay, skin tune. Uh, skin tune is actually kind of awesome uh, if you use it well. It's terrible if you use it badly. So I wanted to give you a a quick lesson on skin tune so what what skin tune is like let me can, can you get in closer to than one to one yeah i think so you oh, just yeah. increase yeah, the percentage yeah, yeah let's go 300 percent. okay i want to i want to see pixels here we go let's go 500 percent. okay when we get into pixels now i'm going to make my circle really small um you're picking up my circle here on on your end Yep, I sure am. Okay. okay, cool. Okay, so I just want to explain what skin tuning does. So what skin tuning does, it takes basically kind of uh, things that are in the skin color and it makes a blur based on a radius. The radius is works a little like my, my circle here um, where I've got a circle of uh 40 up here these would kind of be the same so it takes a one little dot like that and it blurs it that is a huge amount of blur that would not work right that would not work for me so let's go back to here what you want to do is you want to look at your image one to one when you're using skin tune because when you're too far out you might not see what you're doing you want to see uh, close. There we go. Uh, and by the way, I, I made a JPEG of this one just because um, on Zoom, I'm on a small screen. And if I go one to one, I can't really show you what's going on. That's why this is a JPEG. In the course, you get the full size raw uh, to do the same thing with. Just hopefully, you know, you get more screen real estate than I do. So what I want to do, it's that same idea with effects where I crank it on so that it looks terrible. 
then I'm going to adjust my radius. And what you're going to find is that there's a radius spot where you're going to get too little. That's not doing anything. And then you're going to find the place that's too much. And what you're looking for is just a softening that lands right in between. And for me, that is somewhere about there. I've got softening all over. It's too much. And I would never do that, but that's going to be my spot. Uh, glow um, is just kind of a, a curvy brightening in the skin tones. It's not something I often use. So what we're going to do, we're going to take our skin tune now. And this mask, we are going to set to black. Why am I? I'm talking. Here we go. Set mask as black. That, in effect, turns that all off. We now take a paintbrush, and I take my opacity way down, and I'm just going to brush areas that I want to soften. I want to put a, a soft feathered edge on this. Oh, too much feathered edge. There we go. And so I'm just going to give her a little brush under the eyes. We'll go in, uh, actually, we're going to go in, a, let's head into there. So you're using a mask to sort of selectively apply this? Yes. And so just places where there's texture that I don't really want to see texture. So this part of her eye, I don't really want to see any texture there. And now th this would be to taste. Uh, I don't have a problem. Sorry, my dogs are going uh, crazy upstairs apparently now. Um, this, this would be to taste. I don't have an issue here at all. I. I prefer to leave that kind of stuff right, yeah. uh, up here. I would probably soften here because that texture, no one wants to see. Well, if, if that's a portrait of you, you don't want to see that. And often on the chin, you start getting some texture. Um, I, I don't have a better way to say this. So um, what you'll uh, tend to find is, when people smile and their their skin pulls tight, you'll sometimes get kind of an orange peel texture. So it shows pores and the you shape. You get the pores. Of, uh, <laughs> oh, it, that's it, funny. It, yeah, it's the pores, but you also get some kind of texture that's under the skin. I don't know what it is. It's um, it's, it's probably it's probably fat is what it is. Probably uh, small globules of fat. And so when pe often when people say, obviously you know. Uh, you know, she looks great here, but you'll get that orange peel texture. So this is a great spot to soften in that way too, because we just don't need to see that detail. The detail is not adding to the photo. And I don't want to get caught over retouching, if that makes sense. I don't want her to look retouched. I just want to get rid of information that doesn't need to be there. And if I used a softer lens, because uh, I use really sharp lenses, right? Well, most of us do. Um, and so when we use a softer lens, we you know, these things wouldn't show up the same. So there we go. And then we'll pull back. And then when we toggle on and off, I just have to probably pull in closer for you guys to see that. And, and maybe I may, maybe I went really subtle. It might be too zoom subtle. There we go. It, it is really minor, but it is a nice soft touch. This, this kind of thing goes to taste. I'll, I'll show you one trick you can do if you do too much. So let me crank this up. Let's go over some quick areas. So let's say I go too much and then I step back and I go, well, it's nice and soft, but now for me, she, she looks over retouched. Like I, I am noticing the retouching rather than the photo, especially when I turn that on and off. Uh, so I'll have to pull it in closer for you guys. So the one, the downside to doing this on Zoom is you, you don't, um, you don't really see that. I did make sure on like course wise, when we're going through this and you have the raw files, uh, this was all recorded in like, you know, full screen resolution at 1080. So when I'm toggling things on and off, you will be able to see it. So as I toggle on and off, that is for sure showing up. That looks over redone. I can actually just take the opacity of that layer and dial it back. And that's actually a decent method to use too, is to go a little heavy handed so you can really see what you're doing and then adjust it in post. Yeah, there's so many different ways to get the same effect, but in this case, like, yeah, you could reduce the opacity while you're brushing, reduce the opacity like after the fact over the overall layer, you know, it just depends on how much like granular change I guess you'd need. Now I've, on my list, the other thing I wanted to show you guys was 
uh, eyes and teeth. So my approach for, for that is similar on both. Now, one of the things, I shall do eyes first, and then we'll come back to the teeth, okay? Because we'll show you why we use curves. Okay, so I take a curve, and all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make my brights really bright, which is obviously, you know, pretty much unusable. I take that and I invert that and turn it black. So now that layer is doing nothing. We're gonna go ahead and zoom in on her eyes. Oh, that might've been a little heavy handed for my mouse controls. There we go. We'll make a small brush down at 20%. We're going to paint white. So it's just painting white and letting that effect through. Here we go. A little touch in the iris will really make the eye color pop. A little tap there and we'll move over to that other eye. There we go and we copy that over. There's for our pop of color. Uh, sometimes the catch lights are nice to pop a little extra white into on the, just over the catch light because it'll it's amazing how a small dot will really draw your the viewer's eye to a person's eyes. And let's pull back. And there's her eyes on and off. And if you go, oh, Alec, that's a little heavy handed. Again, you can just take the opacity back and do that to taste. So now we've got a little touch on her eyes. Wow. Let's zoom back in on teeth. Now here, here's a special special example on teeth when you have coffee stained teeth what you'll find is say in, and you might find this in people's eyes too her eyes were were basically white they're, they're not really they're they're a little warm because the picture's warm and so they match if i were to neutralize her eyes they would actually her, her eye whites would look blue in fact i can i can do that for you let's just because we're going to do this with her teeth kind of I'm gonna create a vibrance layer. I am gonna pull the saturation out. Then we're going to set that to black so it's doing nothing, and then we're gonna use that brush effect. If I brush here, <laughs> watch me be wrong now, I suspect this picture is so warm that her eyes, instead of looking white now, I mean, I just did a bad job, but to me that looks kind, that doesn't look white, it looks kind of bluish, it looks, like a like a bluey gray. I don't know if you feel yeah, the same. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah, and yeah, and it's because of the way we we interpret color balance, right? It's that same gray thing. If I were to get, if I were to just cut her eye out and put it over here, you would go, oh no, it's neutral gray. But in a really warm picture, it the way we perceive it changes. So one of the things that's great about layers is you can undo things really easily by just painting it back the opposite way or any mix in between. And that's why I go to the, the trouble of working in layers. So what I want to do is I want to take some saturation out of her teeth. There is coffee staining going on. Now I want to be careful that I don't take it too far back. And one of the things that you want to do is you want to give her teeth one pass when your opacity is down. If, you're, if your opacity is at 100, you're fine to do everything. When your opacity is down, I'll tell you why. Because if I do that once and twice and three times, now if I do this twice, these teeth will never are never going to match up on that opacity. Right, there's like especially, a little bit of overlap. Yeah, especially, there we go. So I can only, I'm gonna hold down the mouse button the whole time for doing all the teeth exactly at 24. And, of course, I hit her gums, which I did not mean to do. So the way we fix that, switch the brush back to black and we just paint around her gums. Still got a little bit of her tooth there to get. Let's make our, our brush smaller. There we go. Now we go, okay, that's that's great and all, but her teeth are, they feel blue. I don't, do they feel blue on your end? Um, I don't think so personally, but yeah, go on, tell me more. Yeah, uh, for, for me, they look a little bit, uh, my eyes are drawn to them. I, when we pull back, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was like, wait. Uh, my head was like so close to the screen, but yeah, when I like pulled back, it definitely feels like it's still within like, that oh, those blue are, gray. Those are crazy teeth. Yeah, and and all yeah. I did remember her her teeth were kind of coffee stained, but now she looks like she's got weird dentures, and that's because I pulled too much color out. So what we're saying is we, we can't, you got to be careful when you whiten teeth that you don't want to whiten them. Um, what you want to do is pull color out. So remember, I, this was about saturation. I pulled all the saturation out and then we go to taste and taste tells me somewhere in there is neutralized. Then I go back to my curves. I zoom in because remember our curves was where I brightened, oops, I brightened her eyes. We're going to do this is, the, this is the same layer where I did the brightening of her eyes. Now I can actually go over her teeth and give those a quick brighten. There we go. And when I pull back, she has got flashy white teeth instead of yellow coffee stain teeth. And that is the secret to getting good white teeth. Um, you can't just brighten teeth teeth have to be neutralized because they've got a color in them. If the color is anything but white, it's going to, as you brighten them, it's going to make them look very yellow. And in a very warm picture, if you neutralize them too much, it's going to make them end up looking blue. And so that's why working in layers where, so like say if I was in, in, in develop where I'm not working with layers, it's, it's difficult for me to do this because you have to keep on, you have to adjust these after you've worked with them because when you're working in close to something, you will perceive it different to when you pull it back. And it's that same idea as when we look at colors, everything that we look at color and contrast wise is controlled in our visuals by what's around it. And so when we are zoomed into something, we'll see it completely different to when we pull back. So her teeth will look one way there yeah. and they'll look completely another way there. And working in layers, when you're retouching somebody, um, my goal is to not over retouch. So people are, are noticing the person and not the retouching and having the extra opacity changes that you can dial in so you can soften up that retouching. So there we go. For me, that is looking like, I. I it just looks like a nice portrait. I mean, her flyaway hairs are driving me crazy <laughs> and I got a lesson on how to fix those and m make it not noticeable. This piece of grass is driving me crazy. Uh, cover all those in the lessons. It's interesting, Alec, too, because it's like, you know, choosing that mode to make these changes feels like you're making like a photographic art decision versus like, you know, just adjusting whatever inherent values there are. But um the other thing about that too is like, because you have these three like adjustment layers, you're able to, um, and I would assume that your workflow would be like to choose, Hey, I've got, you know, 35 photos of this woman and I'm choosing five of which, you know, or something like that to make like the, you know, 35 are great photos and then five, which I'm going to make like uh, substantive edits to. And then this would be that image. In this case, you're, you're going in and you're selectively editing one photo because you think it best represents the set of photos or something like that. A absolutely. And so, I mean, just quickly on that as, as a workflow, if I were delivering to a client, like if she was my client, I mean, and I don't generally work that way um, these days, uh, I literally go on set. I take the photos and I am done at the end of the day. I, I hand it off and it took a long time to get comfortable with that idea that people are going to see my raw photos. I can't go in. I can't fix things. If I made a dud or I did something wrong, everybody, you know, is going to see everything. And I, and I think that makes it easier to be transparent with this kind of stuff because I, I'm used to people being super critical of my work and tearing it apart. Uh, if I'm going to deliver these, I would go through and I would select them uh, in develop and I would kind of optimize them and I'd give her 30 photos and I'd give them to her small because when they're small, she's going to see the whole image. Again, when you zoom into an image, you see it different, right? So I want control over that. And then when they pick those images, they get back to me. That's, yeah, when I, I take those into the edit suite and I pick my like top three or five and I'll go through and I'll do this process. And I, I try not to call it retouching, I call it optimizing. Yeah, so totally. um, 
that kind of does it for me today. If anybody's got any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer. But uh, course-wise, um, that's just a snippet. Super, super, <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Super proud of it. Got a zillion lessons on all of these things. And we just touched on a couple. Um, that was super cool, Alec. And I also appreciate you answering, um, yeah, all of uh, my questions, but then also some of uh, the questions here that the people have been posting. Um, Sheila asked, how can we get a gray card? Um, I'm assuming for use of it within their images. And I feel like that would be fairly easy to just set all of the saturations in like edit mode or something like that to their medium values and then just save that file, I guess. Right. Like how, yeah. how would you create a gray card? Um, oh, how would I create a gray card? I Randy said, said great presentation. Ed said fabulous. Uh, Burned had to go unfortunately, but he thought it was extremely useful. So. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everybody. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think I know the answer to that. And actually I'm going to make a tutorial on that. Cause I, I a hundred percent think it's very, fairly easy to just use the fill tool to, and the color picker to, uh, to create a, a gray. So I'll do a tutorial on it. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great one. And you know what? I just, uh, wrote a note along with my, uh, extra, uh, two person, uh, post production stuff for Roger. I am just going to add a gray card, uh, as a download. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Into the course. Um, so everybody, thanks again for participating. Um, Alec is going to head off. We're going to do another one of these, the exact same course. No, not different co content. We're going to do one a little bit later today. Uh, for those of you that want to participate again for some reason, uh, feel free to sign up on our website. And just again, just because Alec, this is like a preview to the course. If you're interested in that course, I'm just going to relink you to... Uh, the content, uh, the page that you can check it out and know that um, because we're doing this as a uh, promotion, um, all of you that participated in the workshop, you'll, if you use the promo code I've supplied in the chat box there, um, you can uh, get $5 off. So, so please, if you're, if you're interested and you like the content that we, we, uh, Alex showed today, uh, go get it, go buy. Uh, it's a it's a huge course. I didn't realize it was so big. There's like there's like uh, eleven or twelve uh, videos there. Yes, it, it uh, the scope ended up fairly big on it. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you everybody. Yeah, uh, a fantastic day. If you tune in later, um, it will be awesome. If this is the only one you're showing up for, you showed up for the best one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You got us fresh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, take care, uh, Alec. Um, we'll talk to you later in the day, Adam. Yeah, just throw me back the, uh, I guess, throw me back um, uh, host privileges before you head out. Oh, that's a good, that's a good idea. And I, uh, do I just stop share? No, I think you just like go to my name in the participants under panelists, uh, and there should be more, and it'll give you the ability to just hand it off, I think. Participants. Oh, there you go, panelists. Yeah. I'm looking at the wrong screen. You're There you are there. Well done on that. More... You are the host. Excellent. Okay, well, Alec, well, I'll talk to you later. Uh, thanks again. That was sweet. Awesome. I had fun. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Adios. Have a fantastic day. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye. Um, yeah, thank you, Danny. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Norman. There was a ton of you. Thank you, Ma. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. So like I said, uh, feel free to sign up to the one that's... Uh, we're going to do it. So we're Pacific time. Um, so... Uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time is the next one. Again, like, don't feel like you need to. It's just going to be the same content. We just decided to split it up. And the reason why is because so that we can accommodate for people that are in different time zones. Um, yeah. And uh, this will be available on our YouTube channel. I will be posting it within the next couple days once I've had a time to just uh, edit out the front and back of this, uh, this workshop. Um, but thanks to you all for participating. Once again, um, you can go to our website, um, the link to Alex courses is there. And then uh, for all of you that participated, the promo code is port 101 and you can enter it, enter it where it says coupon at checkout. So that gives you a, a little bit off, which is cool because it's a brand new course and it seems sweet. A lot of it uses ACDC. So for those of you that are like wanting more uh, structure and, and more use of ACDC in your uh, tutorials, that would be really helpful. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, uh, Andrej. Uh, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Dave. Cool. Yeah, it was awesome. But yeah, like I said, I'll have it up on our YouTube page within the next, probably the next couple days. 
I would say. If I don't get to it tomorrow, I'll get to it certainly on Friday. Uh, here's that information again. Uh, Jason, no way. Eh? Did, did you enter it without the... Um, Ba, 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 ba. Did you enter it without the uh, quotation marks around it? It would have to be just port 101. If that is the case, um, if anyone has any issues with the promo code, I don't know why you would, but if that is the case, just email me. I'll put my email in the chat as well. A price at acdsystems.com. Uh, and I'll make sure that, uh, uh, that my uh, the head of marketing gets to you so we can get that rounded up. Yeah, cool. Jason, just shoot me an email. Um, yeah, for sure. We'll sort that out today. Um, thank you, Martin, Kathleen. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to head out in a little bit here. I'm just going to keep the lobby open so that everyone can still see the link, the promo code and my email. Um, and, but yeah, I'm going to sign off, but if you have any questions, uh, like again, uh, with anything that's related to this or, uh, the product, if you had, have anything you want to suggest for future, um, for fe uh, features, uh, for new new um, editions of the software, keep in mind that I we take those very seriously and I uh, send those off to our developers. Um, yeah, so please do that. How many attended this, e this workshop? There was 160 people that attended this one. Um, yeah, and uh, the next one I think is roughly the same numbers. So yeah, lots of people. Thank you, David. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, cool. I'm going to mute my mic. Uh, I'm going to leave the lobby open for another couple minutes uh, just so you can get any information you need. And then uh, all of you have a lovely day.